My name is Lacey Carey. I am a BCBA at HeartSpring. I have been at HeartSpring for 13 years. Um, I started at the front desk in pediatric services as a receptionist. And within my first six months of being at the front desk, I knew I wanted to be on the other side of the counter, um, really hands-on in helping these kids make all of this lovely progress I got to observe each and every time they came for sessions. Um, so as soon as the therapy aid position opened up, I was then, we only had 12 outpatient therapists. So I then moved to a therapy aid for those 12 therapists. And then when our ABA department started up, um, they were like, we need you over here. Uh, for the training, we used to have to do Kate Cart training for Kansas Medicaid, and they sent me to Dodge City for my training. And while we were there, part of the training included us observing in a special education classroom. And the SPED director came in and asked how many of us were working in Western Kansas when we were done. And nobody raised their hand. <laughs> And that was really an aha moment for me. It was a see a need, fill a need. If there are this many kids in this area, because the district SPED director told us the entire county wait list was full and they had zero providers. So I knew that if there was that much of a need in that small area, then that was a need that I wanted to help remedy. And so I came back and told my boss, I said, I'm going back to school full time. This is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. <laughs> and immediately enrolled in an undergrad program full time. And that was 2013. I graduated with my bachelor's in psychology with an emphasis in ABA in 2015. And then I decided that when my child was older and I was twiddling my thumbs, not knowing what to do with myself, I would go back and get my master's. And so 2018, <laughs> I went back for my master's and it would have been a year ago, February, I graduated with my master's. And during that time, I was a supervisor for autism services and I was able to provide parent training. And I really discovered that that's where my heart is. I have been given all of this knowledge, all of this education on things that I know and have seen to work but I want to give those skills to parents because they're the ones that are going to be with their kids long after I'm gone. So I went to my boss again and said, see a need, fill a need. I got something else for you. She said, I love the idea. Write it up, give it to me. And the family empowerment program started last August and I'm providing parent trainings and identifying what it is that I can help with and teaching these parents how to help their kids which is what I'm hoping that I can do a little bit of today. Um, it's not going to be individualized, but it'll give you a general overview on how to maybe get past some of the hurdles that you may be facing as parents. Um, so that's what I do and that's why I'm here. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about action and commitment therapy. And what got me into action and commitment therapy is because meeting with parents I'm like, I'm coming in and I'm telling them all the things, but they're just not able to do all the things that I can do. <laughs> like, how do I help to identify the barriers that these parents are facing and help them to get past that so that they can create all of these wonderful changes in their home that they're wanting me to help them with? So what is action and commitment therapy? It's lovely, that's what it is. Let me give you a quick overview. So in ACT, which is what it's called, it's acronym, it helps to create a space to do hard things. And I've done lots of training on these. I've figured out lots of ways to apply this to what it is that I do specifically. But in preparing this presentation, I really begin to recognize how I use it in my own life as well. So it is used for all the things. Um, ACT is Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, which is empirically supported mindfulness-based therapy that was created by Stephen Hayes in 1986. It is the acceptance of what is out of your control and the commitment to taking action that enriches your life. So the aim of ACT is to create a rich, full, and meaningful life 
while accepting the pain that inevitably grows with it. It does not address the specific symptom reductions. So it does not remedy the problems that you are facing, but it focuses more on the internal process that hinders you from making those external changes. So ACT has a couple acronyms. Um, it starts with the psychological inflexibility, fear. These are the things that are holding us back from getting us to where we want to be. And the F stands for the fusion of our thoughts. E is the evaluation of the experience. A is avoidance of the experience. R is the reason giving for behavior. And then how do we change that? We change that with ACT. We accept our reactions, we choose a value direction, and we take action in order to get there. So I hope everyone has a pen and pencil or paper. And if not, please come back and get these questions because before we get into all the deep, heavy stuff, I would like to start off with helping you to discover what is truly important to you. And we are going to do that by having, oh no, go back. How do I do that? <gasps> Tristan, how do I go back? I see arrows. Okay. So I would like for you to identify three wishes that you have for your family. If you don't have three, that's okay. If you have five, that's okay. And if nothing comes to the top of your head, then write it down and come back to it later. That's okay as well. And the three wishes that you have for your child, if you have more than one child, you can do one for each of them. You can do three total, whatever works for you particularly. And then number three, I think is oftentimes the hardest one for us as parents, um, but it's important and we will get to that later, but it's important to include three wishes that you have for yourself as well because I think we all know as mamas, there's a reason that's number three on the list. Okay, are we ready? All right. So, boop. Now that we've identified in a perfect world, these are all the things that I would want my life to look like. <laughs> Let's talk about the reality of kind of how things are. And then we'll talk about how to get from point A to point B. <laughs> so, that we all think that having kids will make our lives a better place. They'll bring us an abundance of joy and happiness and fulfill our lives. And we think that motherhood is going to look like one of these pictures, where in reality, it really kind of looks like the other one. <laughs> Not exactly what we were expecting. However, the part that you don't see, the love and the care that we have for our kids below that surface 
is what makes it all worth it, even if the image isn't exactly as beautiful as we dreamed it would be. So just as our kids grow and develop throughout the course of childhood, it's also important to recognize that parenting has a developmental process as well. And there are different stages throughout childhood where our parenting methods, our parenting styles need to take those developmental shifts as well. That is not to say that your child will be completely different the day that they come home from preschool, although some might, but recognizing that this is a common variable in creating change in children, I think helps us to be proactive rather than reactive when we're just like, what is happening with this kid? Um, these are common times when we kind of have to reevaluate and readjust how it is that we are parenting our child so that we can make sure that we provide them with the support that they need through these transitions um, and helping them mature and develop. I, am, I don't believe in terrible twos. I believe in terrible teens, just my personal opinion. Everyone's entitled to them. <laughs> But I, I would take some toddlers over teenagers most any day of the week. <laughs> Just my personal preference. <laughs> so, in regards to parenting a child with autism, um, there are some realities that come along with that as well. Raising a child with autism also often involves chronic challenges. My little, get away. I'll make it go away. Um, chronic challenges consistently associated with high levels of psychological distress. Parents of children with autism often experience more stress, depression, and relationship difficulties relative to parents of children with other disabilities and typical developing children. Psychological distress can significantly impact a parent's ability to manage their child's behavior and reduce the effectiveness of behavioral interventions and even after seeing significant improvements in your child's functioning, parents can continue to experience a considerable psychological distress. Um, another article that I read said, referred to it as they constantly feel like they are in a cycle of crisis, even after progress begins to be seen. So I've told you what had you envision what life would be like in a perfect world. <laughs> And then I gave you um, some realities of possibly what it does look like. But I did this because I want you to recognize that although it may feel isolating, what you are going through, those feelings, those emotions, um, the emotional distress that you may be feeling, you're not alone. Um, this is common for parents of children diagnosed with autism. And I wanted you to kind of recognize that this is, this is a commonality. So if we want to get from point A to point B, how do we get there? Well, I think I like to refer it as we have trouble getting there because we get stuck in parenting ruts. I see it as those tire tracks on a dirt road after a big trucks come by and they're the ruts where it's oftentimes hard to get out of those and get onto a new path. So hopefully these will help you to get there. So some of the ways that parents often get stuck is through coercion and convincing your child to do something that doesn't really teach them anything other than how to be excellent negotiators. Um, parenting with rule governed behavior, very rigid, very strict, very my way or the highway, by golly, we're going to because I said so type of parenting style. Um, becoming overly critical of yourself or your child. Mom guilt is real. So these are some of the barriers that prevent us from getting out of those ruts. We have to identify those before we can get past them. Um, having impossible high standards for self and others. I think that that and overly critical really go hand in hand because when you have those high standards, then you're often feeling as though 
you have to meet that certain criteria. And if you don't, the next one comes into play, which is that negative self-talk, that self-condemnation. Um, we as parents often are really good at carrying that negative self-talk. I think oftentimes we feel as though our child's behavior is a reflection of us, which I'm here to say is absolutely positively not true, even though I suffer from that as well. Being inflexible, um, not being able to shift off of your given plan for the day, for the week, for your child, when there might be variables in there that we need, need to be flexible around. Um, there are definitely days when we don't feel well and we have a headache or we have a stomach ache or we're tired and that affects our behavior throughout the day and we need to have that same flexibility with our children. Um, having the always or never mentality. My child always does this. My child always does that. Every time I talk to them, they always do this. That really hinders our progress from being able to see possibility. If we think that it's always going to be that way, then we can never see it as being anything different. Same thing goes with never. If you say my child would never do that and my child would never eat this and my child would never go there, then you never explore the possibility of your child being able to do those things. Um, difficulty regulating emotions. I feel like when we carry all of that emotional distress, this is easy to do. But to those around us, they never know what version of you they might get. They don't know if you're going to be happy mom or sad mom or glad mom or crying mom or screaming mom because you're struggling with all of those internal emotions and your difficulty in regulating those our children are able to see. Um, excessive people pleasing or I am fine. So always worried about everybody else and far less worried about yourself. Again, another commonality found amongst, I think, most moms. Um, and even though on the inside you're not okay, you don't have a moment in your day in order to attend to that because you're so busy making sure everyone else is taken care of. Um, holding grudges or taking things personally. I think that this is something that probably develops over time with possibly a little pinch of resent resentment in there. Um, because as moms, we often feel as though we carry the weight of the world on our shoulders and we might have some grudges that uh, others aren't maybe helping us to carry that load. And therefore, when we have a grudge or there's a little pinch of resentment, we take things personal. Um, there are a few of these that I made their own slide for because I think that I see these most often. Um, engaging in our own escape avoidance behavior. So our escape behavior would be doing whatever it takes just to make something stop or go away. That something could be replaced with child for some of us, doing whatever it takes to make our child stop what they are doing or to make it go away. Um, providing your child with things that you wouldn't normally give them in order to prevent a tantrum from happening at the grocery store, that is escape behavior or avoidance. Um, Avoiding is going to be where you are trying to prevent having to experience something that is hard or difficult, but escape avoidance over time creates this relationship where you begin to see your child as aversive. You begin to see your child as, oh no, don't want to poke the bear, don't want to go there. Um, there's just a lot of aversion that comes from that, and that greatly hinders your progression towards establishing those meaningful and positive changes in your life. So these last two down here, I, throughout my college journey, told myself quite frequently, short-term inconvenience, long-term results. Going to school full-time, working full-time, being a single mom full-time, that was very inconvenient. And I had to remind myself that this is a short-term inconvenience in order to get where I want to be, in order to do what I want to do, in order to help all the people I want to help. It was a short-term inconvenience on my part in order to have long-term results for others. Escape avoidance does just the opposite. 
It gives you a short-term convenience. In the moment, it fixes it. But inadvertently, it comes with some really long-term consequences because we have just started something that we're going to be expected to maintain um, from our child, from whoever it is that we're engaging in these behaviors with. And so it's really just evaluating whether or not the decisions that you're making in your life are creating those short-term inconvenience to get those long-term results or oh, short-term inconvenience to get those long-term results or vice versa. Um, I really like analogies. And I also see this as the same thing as dieting. Um, the, that requires short-term inconvenience in order to have a long-term result. We can get those short-term convenience and we can eat all of the snacks, but it's gonna come with some long-term consequences. And the same thing happens when we respond to our children in these ways. Um, engaging in excessive worry, fear, anxiety, control, or certainty. I am never going to tell you that you should not worry about your child. That's unrealistic. However, <laughs> When you do it excessively, at the end of the day, it doesn't change anything. It actually only probably makes you miserable. Um, and it also prevents you from seeing what is good in your life because oftentimes you're disengaged in the moment because you're distracted by your thoughts or vice versa. You are hypervigilant because of your weary fear or anxiety. And that is more like the helicopter mom where you're just always right there on top of them, making sure everything is okay. So I have a couple little videos. Um, this first one is going to really show you an example of that excessive worry, fear, anxiety, control, or certainty. And then I'll give you a little disclaimer after the second one. So this is what we want. We want to keep our little fishy in its nice, safe, place. <laughs> and as long as we never let him out, then he'll never get hurt. Right? Squirt does flying solo. Just eggs, leave them on the beach to hatch, and then coo coo ca choo, they find their way back to the big old blue. All by themselves? Sure. But, 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 dude, how do you know when they're ready? Well, you never really know, but when they know, you'll know, you know? Oh. Love it. Okay, so we all know what kind of, um, dad he is. He's a little bit of the, the control and wants to make sure that we keep it contained and we have control and this nobody gets too far. Oh to no. Okay, sorry, I had YouTube going. Um, Okay, so that was an example of one little um, helicopter dad wanting to control all the things. And then we got an example of what it's like to kind of let them venture out and see what happens sometimes. So full disclaimer, this next video is going to take that to an extreme, but it has a really good meaning and purpose behind it. So please disclaimer, Always be there to make sure that your child is safe and is not going to get hurt. 
but I want you to see how allowing a little bit of space for this particular child, the mom knew was necessary, even when it made her feel uncomfortable. So. I got it started. I'll share my screen now. I hear you too, Mama. You're right there. Hey, you're sorry. Why are you crying, Mama? Okay, can you see my PowerPoint or do I need to do it again? I'll just do it again to be safe. <laughs> okay, so that one is really hard for me to watch, but I think that it sends a really important message about how sometimes we have to do hard things that make us feel uncomfortable, that make us step outside of our comfort zone in order for our children to reach their full potential. Um, I have a personal experience that I feel that could relate to this. Um, I have a child, oh no, I went back. And when he was a senior in high school, it was probably the hardest time of my life because I had to trust that I had given this, him the skills that he needed to know the difference between right and wrong and to make the right decisions because I had vowed at a very early age that I wanted to allow him to fall while he was still under my roof 
before I sent him out into the world and he had to learn the harsh way. So his senior year of high school, I promised myself I was not going to make sure that he made it to work or school on time. Knowing that some lessons in life have to be learned, they cannot be taught. Responsibility is one of those I could not teach. It is something that you have to learn and you have to experience for yourself, which is kind of what that video really was an example of. And do you have any idea how hard it was for me to walk out that door? <laughs> Knowing there was a high likelihood that my child was going to be late to school. But I had to learn him. I had to allow him to learn that for himself. Because if I don't allow him to fall while he's still under my roof, then I'm not going to be there to teach him how to recover from those. Um, he's going to have to learn how to figure that out on his own and process that on his own. And I felt like that was part of my responsibility as a parent was if I'm going to teach you all the ways to try to avoid those, I also need to be able to teach you how to recover from those. And so pulling back and watching him learn things the hard way was by far the hardest part of parenting for me ever because we spend our whole lives making sure that they do what they're supposed to do and they're where they need to be and they got all the things that they need. And then there comes a point in parenting where we have to learn to pull back a little bit. And it's super hard, super hard because we want to fix it and we want to do all the things for them. Um, but that's not actually what is in their best interest. Oftentimes that is a disservice to them rather than providing them with the guidance and support and help that we think they need um, long-term, so. Um, and this one. So, the good news and all those barriers, ways that you might get stuck, things that are holding you back, struggles that you might face. In summary, you're not actually stuck. You are committed to a certain pattern of behavior because those behaviors have helped you in the past. Sometimes, I'm not going to say now because I don't know all of you, but sometimes those behaviors can become more harmful than helpful. And they might be the reason why you can't more move forward is because you keep applying these old formulas to a new level in your life. Change the formula and get a different result, which is ACT. So acceptance is the first part of ACT. Acceptance is being where you are just as it is. Oftentimes we have this illusion. I will be happy when I, I've, I've said I'm all done with school. <laughs> but then in reality, I get all done with school and I'm like, okay, now what? <laughs> So I feel like oftentimes we are so focused on the light at the end of the tunnel that we forget to take a look around and realize that the tunnel that we're in isn't such a bad place to be. Oftentimes it's safe, it's comfortable, but we're so hyper-focused on what's ahead that we forget to be present in the moment. I oftentimes think that when we are so focused on the light at the end of the tunnel, we also frequently forget to turn around and realize how far we have come. That tunnel started somewhere else. <laughs> and the closer you get to that tunnel, the further you have come from where you once were. And I think that that is so important for us to remember, especially as parents, because I know it might feel like you are in the longest tunnel you may have ever experienced, or may, maybe right now you're between, between tunnels. But when that does happen, it's important to remember how far you have come, remember the journey that it has taken to get there so that you appreciate that light once you get there. It's not just a finish line and we're done. Because suffering begins the moment we wish our reality is different than it is. I'm just gonna let that sit with you for a minute because I think that is so huge. The minute we wish things were different, we lose focus of what we have. Um, the, I even can experience this in my days. And I'm like, okay, spilt my coffee, no big deal, we're going to be fine. The more things that go wrong throughout my day, the worse my day gets. 
But I've realized that that seems to happen through this mindfulness, through this act practice, that seems to happen when I get in that headspace. Oh no, my coffee spilled. It's okay, it's gonna be a good day. I have mentally alerted myself to watch for whether or not this is going to be a good day or a bad day. Whereas the things that happen throughout the day, I'm like, man, this day just keeps getting worse and worse. But if it would have happened on any other day, they may have been things I might not have even noticed. So suffering begins the moment we wish our reality is different than it is. What do we do about that? The inability to accept our reality hinders our ability to move past it. So we need to recognize that change is not a threat, it's an opportunity. Because survival is not our goal, transformative success is. So although it may not be what we want it to be, we have to accept it as it is before we can move forward. And I would love to tell you that I have this magical remedy or powder that I can just sprinkle it on your head and all will be well with the world. But I feel like this acceptance piece is something that's individualized for everyone because I don't know your specific journeys or battles that you face or struggles that you have overcome. So just really identifying what it is about my reality that I'm having a hard time to accept and what can I do to get past that so that I can move forward. So once we are able to come up with that acceptance, how are we able to move forward past that so that we don't get stuck into another rut? And essentially paying attention on purpose, just like I said, I notice all the things that happen after I spilt my coffee. We're going to try to do that in a positive manner. <laughs> So oftentimes, this is what our mind tends to go to. I need to clean the house. I need to get going. I need to make the dinner. I need to give her a bath. When in reality, while our mind is on this hamster wheel of things that have to be done, this is the journey that we're missing out on. I miss the art she was looking at. I miss the song she was trying to teach me. I missed hearing about her rough day. I miss that funny dance she does. Again, that goes back to being distracted and disengaged in the moment. So it's all about really where we turn our focus to. Are we going to get lost in our thoughts of either what's going to happen in the future or the regret of what's happened in the past? Or are we going to choose to be mindful in the moment so we don't miss out on all these beautiful things that are surrounding us? So in order to do that, you have to pause. Press a pause button. Give yourself five seconds. Notice what has your attention. Are you in your thoughts? Are you on your phone? Are you in the TV? Are you worried about your to-do list? Are you worried about all of the dishes that are in your kitchen? What has your attention in that moment? And then notice how you talk to yourself. If I tell myself I'm gonna have a bad day, guess what? I had a bad day. <laughs> Your self-talk is so very important. Again, working on what is internal so that we can make those changes externally. Notice and take the time to notice and appreciate all that is good in your life. So when I was making these slides, part of me was like, I'm going to do a visual for each one of these. And when I say notice or appreciate all that is good in your life, if that means that you have had a no good, very bad, day, step outside and look at the sunset, step outside, look in the clouds, find something that is beautiful in your life. There's always something. Paint your fingernails, I don't care. <laughs> but notice and appreciate something good in your life because until we can start seeing that good, we have no motivation to seek more of that. Notice how you respond to people and begin to explore if maybe there's additional factors that may have influenced how you responded to them. I just got a be bad email and so I was snarky to Tim next door. That had nothing to do with Tim, but Tim doesn't know that. How I responded to him was something I was internally battling and I took it out on somebody else. Again, noticing how you talk to yourself and the effect that has on those around you. All of this mindfulness is a lot. And I don't expect you to say, okay, I'm going to check all five of these boxes today. No, 
act is a slow, small progress in the right direction. These are tools to help you get to where you're going. These are not things that I want to add to your to-do list. These are not things that I want you to check, check, check. I did it all today, all is well with the world, but it's just something to start being mindful of. And then notice what you are doing and why you chose to do it that way. When I read this one, I primarily focus on those interactions with our children because I feel like oftentimes we go into that autopilot mode and addressing them and giving them instructions and telling them their daily routine can very commonly become mundane. And I would like for us to pay attention to what we're doing and why we choose to consistently do it that day and whether or not that is good for us. Because we want to approach, appreciate all that is good, but first we have to identify what it is we're doing and if it's something that's working for us or if it's something that might need to, to be changed. So once we are ready to start making those changes, we are able to start recognizing all of those areas in our life. We want to choose to identify those areas of your life that do not align with what's truly important to you. And that goes back to your values because if you are working on something that does not align with your values, your motivation to do so, your desire to do so, your enjoyment in doing so is going to greatly decrease. So make sure that the battles that you choose to face are something that align with where you want to go. When it comes to interacting with others, say what you mean and mean what you say, because that is what establishes that level of trust with others. Or, again, in reference to your children, if you don't mean what you say and say what you mean, then your children know I got a 50-50 shot that there's going to be follow through on that. <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and test it this time. If you choose to speak, make sure that you're thinking of what you're going to say before you say it, because you want to make sure that you're able to back that up. Um, that was something else that I was extremely mindful of as a single parent, because I knew there would be nobody else <laughs> that could come in and say, I know she said a month, but you really only have to be grounded two weeks. No, I was the only boss in my house. So I had to make sure that what I said, I was going to be able to back up. And so I made the choice again, very early on, that I was never going to punish him when I was angry because I knew I was more likely to say something I did not mean. And sometimes that would mean mama needed 20 minutes to cool off. And sometimes that means you're not going to know what your punishment is until tomorrow because I'm real mad right now. And he is grown now. And he often tells me that that waiting process was by far the worst part. <laughs> um, he said, we just talked about it on Mother's Day. He was like, I wouldn't play with my toys. I would sit in there and just worry and pace and he'd poke his little head out, mom, do you know what my punishment is yet? And I'd be like, nope, not yet. Go back to your room. He's like, okay. But it's because I knew that I was the, I needed that respect from him. And so I could never say things that I didn't mean or punish myself by saying things. <laughs> Um, that I, I didn't want. Like, you can't have electronics for a month. Um, okay, I got off there. So choose where you focus your attention. Be mindful of what you spend your time on. Be mindful of what you spend your thoughts on. Be mindful of your moment-to-moment -moment choices and choose not to miss out on what is here, now, and in front of you. I know that we hear all the time that... Um, our children grow up so fast and one day you're going to miss this and you're like, yeah, probably not, but it truly is true. Um, so cherish those moments that you do have because they do grow up entirely too quickly. So when we begin to slow down, when we begin to be mindful of our thoughts and our actions and our words and the effects that it has on ourselves and those around us, it's amazing what you will learn and begin to experience. So 
this was the way that we our minds used to work and this is how i would like for your mind to work instead so this is the easy way i need to do this and i need to do this and i need to do this but sometimes i need you to do a timeout and have this be the only item on your list so some strategies to help us get there because that's a lot of information Accept that which you cannot control. Easier said than done. I know it's a process. It's not a transformation. <laughs> as long as we're moving in the right direction, maybe one day we'll get there. Um, enhance and broaden flexibility to purposefully attend to the world around you. Undermine your need to control and do all the things. As mamas, we have a list of must-haves and to-dos, and I got to do this next. And at the end of the day, it's your life and your choice. And if you are absolutely exhausted and you're like, I got to make cupcakes to send to school tomorrow, go to Dylan's and get some cupcakes. <laughs> Undermine your need to control and do all the things. Sometimes we have to make those choices to make life a little easier on ourselves. Um, Shift your mindset from how can I change this person to how can I develop a meaningful relationship with this person? This one is a big one for me because at the end of the day, nobody will work for somebody they don't like. So when it comes to your kids, if we are seeing them as how can I change this person, if, if we feel like we are a problem to be fixed by somebody or we are a burden to somebody, that greatly decreases the likelihood that we want to do a single thing to change ourselves in order to appease that person. So as opposed to trying to fix or change them, start to focus on how to develop a meaningful relationship with them because we're far, far more likely to get them to do the things we want to do when they like us. We're not just the person that's barking orders at them, but we're the person who understands them and who gets them and has empathy and compassion and wants to know who they are and what they like and it can change your entire dynamic. Again, compassion and empathy towards those who truly matter to you. Recognize progress, not perfection. As long as you are taking small steps in the right direction, be proud of yourself. Um, in order to no longer care about something, so in order to forget about all of those things that we talked about earlier, we first must identify what it is that you care about most. So just like any other behavior modification, in order to get one behavior to stop, you have to teach them an appropriate replacement behavior. Same thing goes here. In order to forget caring about something, you have to find something else to care about that is more important to you. So when you begin to change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So then we get to the point where we have to choose to do the hard stuff through committed action. More good news. Most of you have probably been in this parenting gig for a while and odds are you already have everything you need to live the life you want. A life that aligns with your values, your hopes, your dreams for you, your child, your family. It is getting past those barriers that are holding you back, those ruts that we've been stuck on, and capitalizing on those strengths. You know your child better than anyone. You know what works for them. You know what doesn't work for them, just as you do for yourself. You know that those negative thoughts aren't good for you. You know that those box of cookies aren't good for you. So step out of your comfort zone, step out of that rut, start making small steps in the right direction and use those skills that I have zero doubts you already have because if you weren't constantly seeking ways to improve yourself as a parent, you wouldn't be here today. Um, so I know that all of you have an entire toolbox of skills when it comes to your child it's just getting yourself into the right mindset to take that committed action to do things 
that will lead you in the right direction. So how do we get there? Be flexible. That does not mean touch your toes, but rather be willing to try something new if what you're doing isn't working. And that goes back to that mindfulness because oftentimes we're in that autopilot mode and we're not even identifying if what we're doing is actually working. We're just doing it because that's the way it's always been done. So be flexible so that when you are in those headspace and you're able to start seeing things that might not be working for you, you're going to pull from that toolbox and be willing to try something else that may have worked some other time. Be consistent. Uh, again, it goes back to that whole diet analogy. If you fall off the wagon, that's okay. Get back up, try again, and continuing moving in that right direction. Don't get stuck. We're all going to have days where we don't do all the things that we wanna do, but we just continue to have it be a progress that's moving forward. Be kind to yourself, your kids, your family, as many people as possible throughout your day because it really does put you in a better mood. But if you don't have the energy to be nice to everyone else, at least be nice to yourself. <laughs> um, create new patterns. Recognize when you become in a rut and take those action steps towards a different path. Keep your expectations realistic. It's okay to set limits. Again, this is not something Oh, it's not a one and done approach. It requires persistence. And it requires you identifying small steps. If I told you to lose 50 pounds in two weeks, you would laugh at me and you wouldn't even try. Not asking for that. I'm asking for teeny tiny small modifications in your life that just begin to head you in that right direction because that's the only way you're going to have success. If we take on too much too fast, it's going to end in failure. We're going to give up and we're going to be back at square one. So small steps in the right direction. And then allow yourself the space and grace to be imperfect. Because at the end of the day, if everyone is fed and nobody is dead, you have done your job. <laughs> um, so this one is really the only slide that's primarily about parenting. And this is just on how to be able to rebuild some of those relationships that oftentimes can be looked at as more as a have to instead of a get to or want to task. Um, appreciate your kids. Acknowledge them when they are being good. If they don't see you recognize that they're, going, that they're behaving, then they're going to be not behaving in order to get your attention a different way. Um, develop a game plan. Be proactive rather than reactive. Um, I say all the time, no ball team goes out to play a game without having a practice first. You have to have your plays ready. You have to have your game plan because if we take that knee-jerk reaction, odds are we're probably not responding in the best method. Um, establish consistency and trust in your child. When you are consistent, your child knows what to expect. Now, I'm not going to go into what consistency should look like for you, but again, if what you're doing isn't working, maybe consistency in that area wouldn't necessarily be where we would start. Um, but when you decide to make a change, remain consistent because then your child knows what to expect from you. And that's when that trust really begins to grow. Be developmentally sensitive. We talked about those different developmental stages where they might experience in some changes and just being aware and mindful of that and sensitive that they might be going through something. Pick your battles. So I have two big ones for pick your battles. One is do not argue with tiny humans. It gets you nowhere. Um, at the end of the day, you're the mom, they're the child. They're allowed to be upset and arguing with them doesn't change that. It really only escalates the both of you in order to try to win. Second one is don't engage in the power struggle. Same thing. Nobody is going to win if both of you are escalated. So learn to walk away. 
And along the same lines with don't argue with a tiny human is it's no fun to argue with someone if they don't argue back. So if you just quit arguing, odds are they will too. <laughs> um, reduce coercion in your life. You should never have to convince your child to do that which needs to be done. If that is something that we are doing, that would definitely be something that I would want to work on um, because back to setting them up for success, is that something that is transferable? Is that something that everyone in their life is going to do for them for the rest of their life? Probably not. So if you have to convince your child to take a bath, odds are they're not gonna take a bath if you're not there to make them do it. So reduce the coercion, convincing your child to do something. Again, you're the mama. Um, understand and recognize your own, personally, um, personal needs. Self-care, very important. You cannot pour from an empty cup. The best kind of parent you can be is to lead by example. So we all know self-care is important, but there are different levels of knowing. We know with our head that it's important, but we don't really know it with our heart because it's not really something we choose to address. So it is something that I think is incredibly important um, for the mamas because it teaches the child to begin to care for themselves as well. So I have a little bit more on self-care to end in my slide. So have compassion for yourself. Show yourself the same kind of kindness and grace that you give to others. Recognize that you are doing the best you can. Recognize what you observe, how you feel, what you saw, what you said. After interactions, just kind of reevaluate those things and be like, is that something that, is that who I want to be? Is that where I want to go? Is this how I want things to be in my life? And if your answer is no, then maybe that's an area we need to work on. Um, it will feel uncomfortable when you start to make these changes because that's something you're not used to doing. Taking care of you is probably not something you're used to doing and that's okay. But if you can't help yourself when you're struggling, then it's difficult to help them when they're struggling. And so we have to model that for them because we're really good at creating space for our kids to learn, but we don't do the same for ourselves. <laughs> but um, I hope that ACT has been able to help you kind of identify ways that you can start to make those changes and lead you in the right direction for yourself, for your child, for your family, um, in all aspects of your life.